have a wonderful passage of scripture here tonight. It's going to be on a deep topic, so I, I pray that you'll stay with me and hang in there on this, and I know the Lord will bless you tremendously uh, on this topic. And the topic is understanding the discipline of God, understanding the, the discipline of God. Hebrews chapter 12 Let's start at verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are expected exercise thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we come to you. We thank you, Lord, for your word, your promises, your presence, and your power. Father, we ask that you feed us tonight from your living word. May we see all of your mercy tonight in these passages to the love that you have for your children. May we seek refuge in you. May we seek the shadow in you. Father, we we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I started reading this, and especially coming off of everything that we've been saturated with the last several, several messages. I mean, all the way from Hebrews chapter 10 through Hebrews chapter 11, the last week we we went over. The one thing that jumped out at me is it's interesting how he just went to encouraging us to endure in faith, endure in faith no matter what the circumstance, if there's suffering going on, if there's affliction, if you're being persecuted. And that's heavily what we've been seeing. We've been seeing the heroes of faith in chapter 11. Look at all of the obstacles they went through. Look at all the persecution. I mean, some were sewn asunder. Some were sawn in half. Some were stoned. And some had cruel mockings and beatings. And all of these things. And then all of a sudden, and and we see in verse 3, it says to consider him, consider Christ, who is our ultimate example, to follow after. Look at him, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, when you stop and think about this, these are God's people. I am a child of God. God loves me. God is all-powerful. He's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. That means all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present. He is the creator and the sustainer of all things, which means that at any time, he can make whatever's happening stop. But yet, we read about enduring in the faith as these people who went through persecution, sickness, illness, that they were victims of the world's hate. Is God not on his throne? Is is someone in control? So when you are a believer going through affliction, going through what you're going through, the torture, can't God stop this? 
Isn't he all-powerful? Doesn't he sustain all things? I believe that's, our, that's why we're seeing this shift now into the chastisement of God. I believe God's on his throne. I believe God is all-sovereign, all-powerful. You know, the, the world thinks of God as being reactionary. Oh, God is just, just as taken by surprise as you are. They don't see God as sovereign. They don't see God has designed all things, has laid out our path before us, and has orchestrated all things. The world doesn't see that. But with our view, boy, knowing our God's sovereign, knowing he's on his throne, knowing he's in control, knowing the providence of God, boy, it changes our outlook of the circumstances of life, doesn't it? It'll change your life. When you see the, the sovereignty of God, it'll change your life. I mean, so here's the objective. I believe when he's talking about the chastisement of the Lord, these verses give us meaning. There's meaning in our hardships. There's assurance of our faith that God is in control. No matter what's happening, you may think, that it's, he's out of control, but no, nope, he's in control. Not only does it give us meaning, it gives us understanding, and it gives us comfort that we are being shaped, we're being trained, we're being discipled and changed into the image of Christ through our sufferings. Through our sufferings. Those are the objectives. Now, you're going to see throughout here, I've already said chastisement. You may hear me say chase <laughs> instead of chast. But the word chastisement appears eight times in seven verses. So what does chastisement mean? Since the Lord is chastising who are his own. Well, the word chastisement is phehadio. And chastisement means to train up a child educate, or by implication, discipline, by punishment, instruction, learning, and teaching. The broad sense of this Greek word, chastisement, it is whatever a parent would do for a child, for the training of a child, and all of the means necessary to their desired end. So whatever it is that a parent is doing to train up a child in the way they should go, that's chastisement. So many times we see chastisement and we, we think the worst. So oh, this is God punishing us. This is God just whipping us for, for being bad and he's angry. I've made God angry today. Well, if you are his child, think of the father-child relationship that's happening here. He is raising us up as if it were, you I mean, think of your children. You raise them up in discipleship. You raise them up in discipline. Uh, now, I want you to do something interesting. If, if you do, if you are writing things down, write down the word disciple. Underneath it, write down the word discipline. Both the exact same spelling. Disciple, D-I-S-C-I-P-L-E. Discipline. The only difference between the word discipline and disciple are two letters, I and N. N. And I love that because in our discipleship, we are in God's discipline. In our discipleship is discipline. One God did for us, the other God's doing in us. It's very similar, I have found, and it's, it's a beautiful topic, when you talk about adoption. Now, discipleship and discipline are more of a master-teacher relationship, where father and child is more of our adoption, adoption relationship. Adoption, adoption has two elements. There's a legal aspect, which God has done for us. We've been adopted by God, we've been separated from where we were 
by his power, legally, judicially, we are children of God. God did it only one time through the transaction of the cross. It's a, a child who's adopted, when they're adopted, there's a legal aspect of it they don't experience. They don't understand. They, they, but, but the Father is doing all of those transactions. And God had taken all my sin and all your sin and placed it on Jesus at Calvary. And now we have been brought into the family of God. He has taken us from the family of Satan, brought into the family of God. We used to have the Father, the devil is our Father. Now He is our Father. But there's the legal aspect of it where we are children. We're not wanting to be children. We are already children. God has already made that so today. If you believe you are a child, and it, you will never lose being a child. He only did it one time in the past at the cross. But there's also an experiential aspect to adoption. Now take that same child, and now the child is in the family. And there's brothers and sisters that he's never had before. But now he's in this family just as much as he was born in this family. And now he, he has to interact. He has to adapt to this family. Well, that is the part of it we do feel we do feel that's the part of sanctification that God is doing in us that is a progress. And day by day, he's conforming us to the image of his son, conforming us to be the child that we ought to be. That's the discipline aspect. So I've taken two subjects, disciple discipline, adoption, adaptation. Right? Both are the same. God has made us disciples. We're, we're, we're not following God to be his disciple. He's already called us to be his own. We are disciples of his. But we're also being disciplined, being his disciples. So I want to talk about these areas of discipline. Now, there's two main points of all of the text which we just read. There is the purpose that God disciplines. He lovingly disciplines his children. And then there is the product, or there's the result. There's the benefit to us. So those two main, perp the two main things that we see in this text. Um, first of all, actually, I wanted to say this. There is a big difference between God's discipline and God's judgment, judgmental punishment. There's a big difference uh, between paying the, for the consequence of your sins versus being under condemnation. The child of God is no longer under condemnation. We will not receive God's full wrath for the, our sin which we've committed, but we may very well suffer the consequences of our sins. We may have to endure punishment and consequence for our sin, but we will never have to endure God's final judgment wrath for our sins. Jesus already did that. Jesus already went to the cross and he paid for the final wrathful judgment of God. So I wanted you to see that difference between these two. Uh, another thing is, you know, men may experience God's judgmental punishment, but his children experience his discipline, his chastisement. So every time I say, Discipline, I mean chastisement. That, that's what that is. Um, so verse 4. Look with me. He says, Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So, of course, all of this is an encouragement of their present predicament. The readers had suffered for the gospel's sake, but they had not yet spilled their blood. Of course, if they're reading it, they've not been martyred. They've not been killed. Their temptation, as we've seen all through Hebrews, was to avoid the persecution. I mean, wouldn't your temptation be to avoid pain and, and persecution and being beaten and being mocked and being embarrassed? And that was their temptation, was to avoid those things. But we've not resisted unto blood. 
Now, remember, consider him looking unto Christ in verse 2. Last week we looked at us looking unto Christ. As much as they faced, it was nothing compared to what Jesus had faced in enduring the cross, despising the shame. Now, the charge here is do not misunderstand your trials. Look at verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation, which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. There's our word faint again. Did you remember we saw it in verse 3? How do we not faint? And that faint is just to give in, that you are overtaken. You become weak through exhaustion. That's faint. You, you become faint when you are burned out. In verse 3, he said, consider Jesus Christ in order to uh, prevent becoming wearied and faint. Now in verse 5, he says that don't forget what the word of God says, lest you become faint and weary in your mind, and the trials take over, the burden takes over, the obstacles, the opposition take over, the darts of Satan just want to be hurled at you and cause you depression. And, and remember what you had read. Now in Proverbs 3, 11 is what he is referencing. Proverbs 3, 11, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So I want to talk about three types of chastisement the Lord will put upon his children whom he loves and give you three examples of those three different types of chastisement. You have David, Paul, and Job. The first one, the first discipline is corrective. Now that's the one most people immediately go to when they think of discipline, is corrective, spankings. And sometimes God does discipline us in order to correct sin in our life. Now, think about David. David, we know, was a man after God's own heart. The Psalms that we read, that David wrote, how in love was this man with the Lord? We see the courage which David had in facing Goliath. He said, is there not a cause? And, and he says, this, this uncircumcised Philistine is no longer going to mock the armies of the living God. So we see the courage of faith which David has. But there was a sin, as most of us know, that was in David's life. He allowed the temptation of the lust of his eyes and the lust of his flesh take over. And there we see the sin which David committed against God with Bathsheba. Not only did he commit adultery, but then he had Uriah, the Hittite, killed, who was her lawful husband. And we see that he had committed this sin, but God had sent Nathan and spoke unto David. And the thing that he spoke unto David is 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12. The thing that caught my attention when God spoke to David, he said these words to David, Because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah, the sword would not depart from your house. Remember all the great things we said about David? But God addresses David and said, this sin, was be this sin that you took is none other than a despisement of God. Now think about that. Isn't that true? When you sin against God, think about or is it covetousness or is it lust? Aren't you breaking out of the state of thankfulness of what God has given you? Aren't you breaking out of the state of being content and praising God for all the things which he's given you and how he's blessed you? Aren't you stepping out of the state of fear before God as our reverent father? All of those things when we sin against him, it's despisement against him. 
We despise him and all that he's given us. We're not thankful. And that, that caught me because David is not, we know generally, that person at all. I mean, in God's holy word for eternity, it reads, David had a heart after God. But yet God considers our sin despisement against him. And so God, out of love, not out of anger, corrects David. How does he correct David? Well, his sin did not cost him his salvation. But his sin did cost him a lot of years of grief. Uh, God had taken the baby from David. So he paid that consequence for that sin. And we see David's just heart change after that. His sons grow up and they were just burdensome. And the sword really didn't depart from his house. It was violent. What had happened with David? He didn't lose his salvation. But God and his love had to correct him. He wasn't going to ignore it. I mean, all the other kings of that time were doing the exact same thing David just did. It's called the king's prerogative. I mean, culture and, and the world and society says, it's okay if you do that. You've earned it. You can go ahead and do it all you want. It won't bother us. Nowhere do we see God's people have a prerogative to sin, despite what culture, despite what society says okay. If God says it's not okay, it's not okay. And if you are his child, he's going to discipline you in a corrective way. The second type of discipline is preventative discipline. Now think about this. As if you're a parent or a grandparent or uncle, and if you've ever had a child in your care, don't you prevent things from happening to them? I mean, you set up fences. Uh, literally and symbolically, you're wanting to guard them and shield them and put a hedge of protection around them just to prevent things that could happen, just to prevent the sin that could happen in their life is what God does to us. There are things, there might be sicknesses or there might be weaknesses or there may be just you're unsuccessful in business or there, just things aren't landing right. Things aren't going as good as your neighbors uh, have it going. There, you don't have as much. You, you just can't get ahead uh, health-wise or financial-wise or just things like that. And it becomes an inconvenience to us. And it becomes kind of like, ugh, <laughs> come on. But that also could be God's loving hand preventing you from sinning. Now, what do I mean? Think about Paul. Do you remember Paul had a thorn in his flesh given to him by God? Do you remember what Paul said was the reason God gave him the thorn in the flesh? He says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm oh, sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He says, Lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelation there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. God allowed the messenger of Satan to buffet Paul, not because Paul was already proud, and was exalting himself, but to prevent Paul from becoming proud and exalting himself. God gave Paul a very unique gift of revelation. And if God had given you that much, I mean, think about if you were Paul in that situation where you're writing down things that God's showing you, like just John. He opened up heaven and showed John. Imagine how you would have the temptation of like, I'm better. <laughs> I'm better than everybody. Well, to prevent that, it's a discipline of training, rearing up that child. God is molding you to make you the child you ought to be, and whatever means is necessary to do that. The first one's corrective. The second one is preventative. The third one is educational. It's instructional. Now, this is where verse 5 kind of comes in. 
when he says, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. They had forgotten the word of God. They had forgotten in their distress and in their grief that word from Proverbs is to despise not the discipline, the training which God is doing in your life. Do not despise it. Sometimes God teaches us more about him through affliction than through blessings. Education. God educates us about him. There's things in your life where you're going to receive instruction. You're going to get a glimpse of what, who God is. Prosperity has a way of making us more self-sufficient, self-satisfied. And you know what? I've got all this prosperity. I don't need God. It makes us think that. Where affliction and problems often make us more aware of our need for God. Now think about Job. Job, the Bible tells us, was a man who was blameless, upright, feared God, and eschewed evil. Job did everything right. But yet God allowed him to suffer pain, loss, grief, sickness, and ridicule. Now Job's discipline was clearly not corrective. Job's discipline by God was clearly not preventative. It was God revealing to Job who God is. It was instructional. God was revealing who he is to Job. The Bible said that Job did not sin with his lips, but he had very little patience for the suffering that he was going through. Why? Because he did not know why. I mean, isn't that all of us? If we're going through suffering, affliction, pain, hardships, and you don't know why, aren't you asking, Lord, why? And that's what Job said. Job spent all of Job trying to figure out, Lord, why? It's, it can't be something I did, despite what my friends keep trying to talk me into. It, and, you know, the thing is, is, Job was educated about God to trust God, to trust him, to trust the decisions God makes regarding you despite you having an understanding of why God is doing what he's doing in your life. That was God's education to Job. Finally, at the end, God reveals himself to Job and says, Job, I'm not going to explain to you what has happened, but I'm God. He's God. And what did Job say when God revealed his majesty and his brightness to Job of his person, of who he is? Job said this, Things, I have learned things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And confess to the Lord in Job 42, I have heard of thee by the hearing of my ear, but now mine eye has seen you. Wherefore, I repent in dust and ashes. Job finally stopped asking those questions. Through his time of suffering, there was confusion but Job learned to trust God for who God is, not for what he himself could see and comprehend. We just leave it in the hands of God. We're, we're not called to understand. Sometimes we may not understand, but God disciplines us and, and he sends things in our way to teach us you don't have to have a logical reason or explanation why God is doing what he's doing other than bringing glory to himself in this situation. That's what uh, Paul had, had said about his thorn in the flesh. God said, my grace is sufficient for thee, Paul. And, and Paul said, well, then I gladly glory. 
I will gladly glory in my, in my afflictions and, and the things of this life that cause me pain, that his strength is made perfect in my weakness. And don't we learn that? I mean, all of these sources of discipline which God gives us, it is educational. It is instructional, whether it's correction, preventative, or instructional. But here is another purpose. So far, we've been looking at purposes. So we see the purpose that God disciplines his children. It's corrective. It's discipleship. It's corrective. It's preventative. And it is instructional. This next, and here we're going to pick it up in verse 6. There's also these purposes. God proves his love to us and our sonship to him through his discipleship, through his discipline of us. So, verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, he disciplines, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? First we see that God proves his love to us. That's another purpose in, in him disciplining us. I mean, when you were a child and you were a discipline of your parents, I don't remember loving it. I don't remember liking it, but I remember respecting it. And I remember respecting them. And then only later in life I saw, yeah, they, they did that to prevent me from doing this. And they, they did that out of love for me. When God the Father disciplines you, yeah, we should, I mean, in any of these categories, it is a demonstration, it's a proof of his love to you as your father. In Proverbs 13, 24, it says, he that, spared, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Betimes means often and early. <laughs> Who the father loves, he disciplines. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 says, and as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent and repent. We understand God's love to us in this way by faith. We know that God is our Father. We know that He is molding us, shaping us, and we are, He, he is conforming us to the image of Christ because remember, you're in His family now. You're in the family of God. So he is conforming us, and he, that he does that through discipline. There was a man who was asked why he was looking over a wall. And the man turned around and said, because I can't see through it. Hey, man, why are you looking over that wall? Because I can't see through the wall. When God's children cannot see through pain, they can't see through suffering, they can't see through the hardships and the heartache. They can't see through the grief. They, they can't see the reasons. They, they can't see why this is happening to me. Stop trying to look through the wall and look over it. We look over those hardships. We look over those trials and afflictions and persecutions. And we see none other but our loving Father, always with his hands of mercy and love to you. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't be doing it. If he didn't love you, we see him. Look over the wall. Look over the pain. Look over the confusion. Look over those things. Don't try to look through it. Oh, I love that God's love for us is infinite. He proves his love to us. He takes no pleasure in our suffering. Just like a parent, I didn't take pleasure in disciplining my children. I didn't love to do it. It hurt me. And often you hear, well, I did back then, but now I understood what dad meant. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I was like, dad, I don't think so. Have you tried one of them whips lately? They hurt. <laughs> Mom would make us go out and pick our own switch. We would have to go find, and if it wasn't big enough, she'd make us go back out, keep the first one we brought her, and then she'd use both of them. So it had to be a big switch for us. Well, 
I don't see how you love me. It doesn't seem like you love me very much. This kind of hurts. Oh, our, our Lord is touched by our grief and infirmity. And he loves you. He does it because he loves you. Hey, Hebrews. Hey, those who are being persecuted and you, and you feel like there's nobody in control. God's in control. And he loves you. And he's disciplining you to be more like Christ, to be more like him. The object of our faith, the example of our faith. I mean, God will also never give us more. You've heard that than we can endure from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. God's love will not allow him to not discipline us. Because God loves us as our father, he's going to. Because the word of God says those who do not discipline their children don't love them. That's what the word of God says. So because God loves you, he must. Because that's who he is. And so that's what we see. So the second thing, the second purpose we see here is not only does God provide and give us proof of his love during this time of discipleship and discipline. He says, verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, all of God's children are partakers of his discipline, in those one of three ways, then are ye bastards. That means illegitimate. And you're not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more, much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits? The second proof which God gives us is the spirit of sonship that we know that we are his children and the purpose of discipline is not only to reveal to us his love to us, but to reveal to us our true status as his children. Because it's God's chastisement. It's God's reproof. It's God's rebuke. It's, it's God's discipline to you. So, yes, it's going to hurt, but in a way, well, I sure am glad God's my father. And he's full of mercy. The second thing it proves is our sonship. Um, we'll move on. Now, in verse 9 through verse 11 starts this result. So do we see the purpose of God in, the, in discipline? There's a purpose you're going through this, Hebrew reader. The purpose you're going through this, person sitting right here tonight. And how much do we neglect to read the word of God to see that. I mean, Peter even says that. Peter says that marvel not. Don't be surprised when you are ridiculed and beaten. But I believe, and, and I took this, that this passage is reminding us of God's sovereignty. Things aren't out of control. You just didn't have bad luck. You didn't just get a bad break. It's under God's control. All of it. He's sovereign. And what is he doing then since he's in control? He's shaping us. He's molding us through those three disciplines. So when he says this, um, shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father's spirits and live? What is the result? Well, we already heard about one result. We saw it twice, was not to be faint and weary in our mind when we go through life. We are told to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the one who's blazed the trail before us, as our ultimate example. Take all of Hebrews chapter 11 and then take Jesus. He's the ultimate example of faith who has endured hardships and things. So we know that, but look at the end of verse 9. Well, one of the products that we will have is life. When we endure his discipline, our response to God's discipline should not be resentful resignation, but willing and grateful 
submission. A Christian's persistent rebellion against God could cost him his life. If God's disciplining you and you still won't listen, you still won't listen, you're still going to do what you're going to do, you're still going to do what you're going to do. We see from the word of God that God will take you. One way or another, now think about this, Paul was on his horse or on his camel. Paul wasn't going to come down off of that horse charging for, towards Damascus to persecute God's people. God had to knock him off of it. God had to knock him off the horse. Paul wasn't coming off of it. When we sin over and over, John talks about there is a sin unto death. He says that in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. Paul says that many of you are sick and have even gone to sleep because you're taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way. Not being corrected in God's discipline could cost you your life. But not only that, not only does it save your life, he gives you life. He gives you abundance of life. He gives you victory in life. Now think about that. If those who have never been to war don't know what victory feels like. Those who have never been in prison don't feel like freedom, don't know what freedom feels like. I mean, God will give us the Holy Spirit and bring us joy and victory. And, and at the end, boy, I, I tell you, I'd love that hymn. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I can face, or the child can face in certain days, and, and all of these things in life that come at us because he lives. We have a victorious life. The, the second benefit we see, not only life in verse 9, but he says, for verily there are few, for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's the second part, to be partakers of his holiness 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God who has called you is holy, so therefore be ye holy. That means separate. Come out from among them. Be separate. Be peculiar. You are a royal priesthood. You've been brought out of darkness into God's marvelous light. You've been brought into the family of God. You're to be different, set apart, holy for His purpose. That's what it means to be set apart. That's what sanctification means. That we are to be someone who has peace under grief and, and God's grace just pouring out of our pores in the most difficult of times. Yeah, they hit us hard. But that's how we are to be different. We're to be holy, set apart. God is shaping us in the image of Christ to be more like Him. God reveals His character to us to be more like His character. Last, we see the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now, no chastening, or chastening for the present seem, verse 11, to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Sometimes this peaceable fruit, I mean, how deep is this? Considering how thin this page is right here, this verse right here is deeper than any ocean on earth. How deep is it that we don't enjoy suffering? We don't enjoy punishment. We don't enjoy chastisement. But what it yields afterwards is the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Um, I don't know how many of you all have been through physical therapy. I remember going to physical therapy. I had I can't remember, a tennis elbow. I had something wrong, and it was just painful all the time. Finally, I went to physical therapy, and I sat down, and if I weren't who I were, I might have punched the guy. He took my arm right where it hurt the most, and he started digging his fingers into my arm and massaging it, and he just grinding it for five straight minutes. And I'm like, oh, you know, I mean, why? Why this much pain? This is where it hurts. Rub something else. <laughs> I mean, that hard, he just 
kept going and kept going and kept going. Well, I, I was like, okay. I don't understand how this pain on top of my pain will heal it. I still don't know to this day. I went five more weeks. But here's the thing. I didn't need to know because he knew. He knew that even though this is painful, this is what you need. This will bring the peaceable fruit of righteousness in your life. Sometimes it's that pain that must take away the pain. There's an unknown author who says, and so what do I say? I say let the rains of disappointment come if they water the plants of spiritual grace. Let the rains of disappointment come if they're going to water the, the plants of spiritual grace. Let the winds of adversity blow if they serve to root more securely the trees that God has planted in my life. I say let the sun of prosperity be eclipsed if that brings me closer to the true light of life. Welcome Sweet discipline, discipline designed for my joy, discipline designed to make me what God wants me to be. Folks, that's looking over the wall. That's not trying to look through it. Let us not become faint. Let us not become weary of mind. Consider Jesus Christ who endured those things for us. Consider him. And because God loves you, he corrects you. Because God loves you, he's molding and shaping you and your faith to draw you closer to him. The discipline which he gave David drew David closer to him. What would have happened if God had never corrected David? The discipline which God gave Paul was to bring Paul close to him. What would have happened if God had not prevented David or Paul becoming proudful. The same thing with Job. The discipline he sent Job was to draw Job close to him. Job had a magnificent view of God after that whole thing, which we cherish to this day. I pray the Lord has richly blessed you and touched your heart. And as we leave this place, just remember God's sovereign. I almost named this sermon proof why you should not listen to Joel Olstein or prosperity gospel preachers. Because the prosperity God gives us is not physical. Think about this. It's spiritual. Actually, the more physical hardships, the more spiritual we become for our growth. So tell me which one God wants you to do more. Spiritually grow. Well, how does he do that? Not through prosperity. And uh, I pray the Lord's richly bless you. Heavenly Father, thank you for this study tonight. Lord, thank you for your dealings with your children as our Father who loves us oh, so much. Father, we are imperfect parents. We are imperfect fathers. For there are times where we may discipline out of wrong motives, but Lord, you always 100% discipline us for our good and for your glory to promote holiness in our lives, to draw us closer to you, to make us more separate and special for you and your purposes. Father, thank you, Lord, for the hope we have and the relief of our faith knowing, Father, that all things work together for good to them that love you, who are called according to your purpose. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, which applies so strongly in our hearts that we are the children of God. We are your children, and it witnesses to us where we come to you as our Father. Father, we do pray for each heart here, each mind, 
Lord, as we leave and go our separate ways, may be with each one. We'll give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.